Okay. We're at the Site C Summit. It's January 26, 2018. I'm talking to Seth Klein, who is the BC Director for the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Um, so, Seth, I mean, your, your area of expertise is economics, and maybe you can talk about the economic justification for the government deciding to move ahead. Yeah, economics and BC Finances, and um, I, I, I was invited to speak here after, uh, mostly based on a piece I'd written critiquing the economic justification that the government offered for, uh, for proceeding. Um, I wrote this piece after the news, uh, the decision was made because when I heard the government say they had no choice because if they terminated, they would have to pay for the interest costs and they would cost $150 million a year in interest and that would derail basically the rest of their agenda. Um, and I just couldn't let that stand. That, that wasn't an argument that I found at all convincing. Um, so the interest costs, if the government took that on, would have been at maximum $150 million a year. That sounds like a lot of money, um, but in the, in the context of the BC budget, it's really a rounding error. Um, it's less than the current surplus. Uh, $150 uh, million, dollars, just to give you some context, is about 0.3% of the annual provincial budget. Um, in contrast, the government has made other choices that are much more expensive. Uh, you know, they, in, the, in September, in their mini-budget, they, uh, they cut MSP premiums by 50%, which I'm all for. Me too. Uh, but I would have liked to see them replace the revenues through progressive tax increases. They didn't do that. They walked away from $1.2 billion, not once, every year. Um, much more expensive. Uh, uh, the Greens have pointed out that if, if you looked at the decision around eliminating the tolls on the Portman Bridge, actually ver the cost of that, very similar to the cost of termination of Site C, and yet, you know, they were able to do it. And interestingly, the September mini-budget um, estimated the impact of the Portman toll decision would be to increase BC's debt to GDP ratio by 1.2 percentage points. Not a lot. You know, our, 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 and so that was part of what I was doing in the summit is just showing people, look, here's our debt position in BC. It's actually really enviable. We have the third lowest debt to GDP ratio in the country after Alberta and Saskatchewan. Even if we took on all of BC Hydro's debt, we'd still have the third lowest debt to GDP ratio by a large margin. Um, so this notion, so which brings me to the other argument the government made, which is that somehow, you know, this would threaten our, um, our credit status and we'd get downgraded. I, I just don't see, I don't, I don't see that as credible. Okay, and you are speaking as someone who's got expertise in this, in this well, field. I mean, well not, some, I mean, I, I tried to marshal some evidence of yes, that. Yes. I, I, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, BC's debt is, uh, is secured against uh, $130 billion in the BC Investment Management Corporation for public pensions. Uh, that's a lot of money. Um, uh, but so also, the, ar the argument that this $4 billion that mm -hmm. was already spent, the, mm -hmm. the number itself is questionable. T $2 billion, just over $2 billion has already been spent. And then there's a question mark about what the remediation cost would have been the government was saying another almost two billion. It, I doubt it would have been. I, I think it probably would have been closer to a, to a billion. So probably more like three billion would have been the total cost. But even if you accepted the four billion figure, it still would have been entirely possible so to just manage. So the economic that. justification for moving ahead with the project was not there. That's that's my feeling, and that the the decisions, the real justification was something else or. More to the point, I think, I guess what, what has concerned me is I think enough people around the cabinet were convinced by senior bureaucrats and finance officials that that economic um, uh, threat was real. Um, and, uh, and that's the problem right there uh, in terms of who got listened to and the influence of the same bureaucrats same senior bureaucrats who've been there for a long time, um, making the same arguments. And as they made to Christy Clark. As they made to Christy Clark, the same advocates from BC Hydro. And, uh, and so 
what won the day were arguments uh, that the cabinet found convincing, but which just don't hold up. There was a lot of expertise saying not only yourself, but others as well, saying exactly what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing in the BCUC report mm -hmm. that contravened what you were saying. I mean, the BCUC report could not no. be used to justify No, that. that was quite, that was really the interesting part. I think, uh, you know, I had my misgivings when they decided to send it to the BCUC. The BCUC is a fairly conservative outfit, truth be told. Um, when the BCUC report came, most of us who saw that thought the BCUC had given the government every reason they needed to terminate. Um, but what we ended up hearing from various uh, MLAs is that the government took the BCUC report and then asked for further analysis of that report from their own finance officials. And that the finance officials came back and told them, well, the costs, as the BCUC said, of termination or continuation were basically equivalent, but that the accounting treatment was not, and, uh, and that the accounting treatment of termination would derail their agenda. Um, my contention is that's not true, uh, that it wouldn't have derailed the agenda, it didn't pose a significant threat, there wouldn't have been a downgrade, and by the way, even if there was a downgrade from the credit rating agencies, um, that's also not particularly consequential. Um, the, the evidence is that a, a downgrade results in very little impact on interest on our bonds. The marginal impact, but it's pretty marginal. So, um, given, but but but, uh, I guess my my other concern is what does it mean to to hear that accounting procedures would trump good policy and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Um, there's something, I think, profoundly telling and wrong with that. Given all that you've said and what's being said here at the summit, can we ask the question, was the NDP's position ever really, as they promised so many people over so many years, to cancel Site C? I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, In other uh, words, was it all a sham? I take them at their word that they found this decision extremely difficult. Um, and I'm sure it was difficult. Uh, and I don't envy them. There is no doubt that the previous government left them with a no-win poison pill uh, that they had to deal with. But my point is, I think when it, when, when the final crux of the decision time came, they deferred for expertise to the same people who have been giving that expertise for a long time and they got the same answer. And, um, and this, the, the point I made in the piece I wrote is that this is the curse of, all, of, all, of many modern social democratic governments, is that they're good people uh, with uh, good values um, and lack confidence in economics. And as a consequence, they let other people, mostly economists trained in neoliberal economics, tell them what is and isn't allowed. And that's really what I saw in play with this decision. Last question, do you have any ideas of where we can go from here to oppose Site C and to make sure things are better in the future? Well, let me answer the the, um, well, in terms of opposing Site C, I don't know. I, I, the, the truth is, I think uh, an about face on this decision is unlikely. I don't think it's impossible. Um, but I think it would take a lot to provide a justification at this point for a reversal of that decision. Um, there are serious geotechnical issues that people have spoken of. And it's possible that if some of that emerged in the coming months and it became apparent quickly that the, that the cost wasn't going to be the latest cost, 10.7 billion, but maybe 12 or 13, um, that might provide a context for a reconsideration. But my motivation in, in writing this piece and coming here to speak was really about 
w unpacking the decision so that so that future decisions don't happen this way. Um, when I heard the justifications, part of what motivated me to write was that I didn't. You don't want. You, won't, you don't want justifications like that to be allowed to stand because they set a terrible precedent for all the next round of decisions. Um, and, and I want a government that feels emboldened to push back when they get scaremongered about credit rating agencies. I want them to feel empowered to say, um, to call bullshit on that, frankly. Um, uh, I think another takeaway is that we need to embed the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in BC law so that something like this can't happen again. And we need to somehow change up the framework by which decisions like this get made so that the government relies less on their existing experts in finance and so on, and more to those outside, more upon those outside government with different perspectives and creative solutions. Especially when their internal experts have gotten them into this mess in the first place. Yeah, very much. Seth Black, thank you very much. Thanks.